now in, in people, in HR. So this is the cross-functional move that we believe it's uh, the optimal, optimal scenario to, uh, to develop people inside the company. So um, I'm, I'm great to, it's great to be here, back here in Chile. Thank you. Um, just to set the stage for the panelists, you know, whenever we think about the explosive growth of data in society, it leads to demand for it, a different type of talent. And not just in traditional STEM fields, but in non-traditional STEM fields as well. Um, that's why I, as head of accounts in the East College of Business, am moderating this panel. We have a strong demand for that type of talent as well. So what I'll ask each of the panelists to do is, you know, it's, this has created considerable demand for analytics talent, but basically to build deep specialized knowledge in the discipline, but then also to bring along with you a different skill set. And so I would just like each of the panelists to take kind of their view, given whether they're coming from a university background, a STEM or traditional non-STEM field, or from industry, you know, their views on what type of skills are in demand uh, and how we might partner again together uh, to fill that need. So I want to start with Darren. Sure. So uh, I'm from statistics, so I have a very STEM-focused uh, view on this. And I do think that the depth is largely going to continue to come from STEM. Um, I do see a lot of students in my classes, particularly in the summer when students from outside of statistics can get in, who want a greater depth in statistical and analytic experience, and that's where they've come to our courses. I, I think there are a couple of different gaps that we probably want to talk about. One is in the number of people with a strong, deep knowledge of analytic techniques, statistical knowledge, programming skills. Another is the gap between um, those in STEM fields and those not in STEM fields the degree of data literacy and how we bridge those gaps. So I think it's really important for students, people of all fields, to become more and more familiar with data, to understand it better, um, to help bridge that gap, as well as the highly technical folks from the STEM fields um, reaching across to help bring them in. So as an individual, my uh, undergraduate degree is in business, and I also have an MBA, so I am technically, academically, from the STEM field, although for the last 20 years of my career, I've worked in data science, um, as we call it today. So I have a, uh, a strong belief that what we need is a baseline of technical credibility, uh, irrespective of what your uh, academic pursuit might be. In the same way that we expect uh, eighth grade students to go through civics and have some credibility um, in terms of um, the basics of how US government works and American citizenship, uh, I think there should be a, a, a basic foundational requirement about how the internet works, how data works, what data privacy concerns um, are, are the kinds of things that should be considered. I think there's a, a level of, of sort of data literacy and, and technical credibility that should be required as a baseline. Again, irrespective of uh, whatever your academic pursuit. I'm very similar to Beth, where I have a business, academic background, an MBA as well that I earned 14 years ago. And so the education system has changed quite a bit in 14 years of what they're teaching, not only in MBA technology, STEM, the courses. So the way that I developed the, the skill set to prepare me for data science, academically, I followed business. Obviously, economics, accounting, marketing, building a business plan. But professionally, I ended up right out of college. I went to a company that was a software development company, and I made a decision. At one point, I could support a particular proprietary piece of that software, or I could start pulling reports and, and start generating data, querying data. And I chose to do that a long time ago, way back when, because I felt like that, that seemed like that's where things were going to go. And I continued to develop an understanding of data, ETL, full stack, and then building into BI, and then visualizations, prediction, and then moving into right now, what we're doing at Amron is trying to do some prescriptive things. And so, it all just lined up and converged into data science. So I'm probably a little bit backwards from your, your typical STEM path, but it all came together at the right time. I would say what we're looking for, whenever we, we had the, the fortunate opportunity to find a data scientist here recently, we were listening to his ability to articulate topics within a data science framework, but we also were looking for something different. We were looking for someone who was enthusiastic, curious, learning-minded person, because in data science, you are that unicorn, right? So everybody says, you're the unicorn, but you becoming the unicorn isn't something you just learn and you shut it off and you're done. It's a lifelong process that takes time and development. And so if you're really wanting to do this, 
you know, the rewards are there, but the supply isn't, and that's why there's a bit of a mismatch, right? So there's a lot, there's low demand, but there's uh, there's a high demand but a low supply, and so to get there, there are gaps, and you're not going to get them necessarily 100% in academia. You're not going to get them 100% professionally, for me at least. My experience was was blended with both. So, so I have a pretty similar background to you, I believe, Dan, um, in that I kind of came up with a uh, sort of typical STEM background. So I got my bachelor's in 2014 in statistics, and then I stayed here for my master's uh, that I got two years later, also in statistics. So I guess I'm kind of boring in that respect. Uh, I think what we look at at Google is what we tend to message externally is what we call uh, T-shaped people, and that's not referring to the shape of your body, but uh, to what kind of skills that you bring. And what we mean by that is, you know, the long stem of the T. We want technical depth. Like, we want you to be good at something. And I'll be explicit. When I mean technical depth, we typically mean statistics. Like, you have to have a baseline statistical knowledge in order to, to succeed at, at a large-scale tech company. Um, and then, more broadly, we want you to have a lot of interest. You know, it's, it's better to have less technical depth than something, because you can always learn that. You can always pick up a textbook and learn about certain things, but you just have to be a curious person. You have to be the kind of person that spends an unreasonable amount of time on Wikipedia just bouncing around between pages, like, wanting to understand different things. You have to be a kind of person that knows what a Cook's you know, Institute PBI is because you're interested in why they were talking about that really the rest of the election. Like you, you generally have to be that kind of curious person. I think, uh, and I can only speak to my experience because I don't have direct reports, um, so I don't do hiring in the traditional sense, but I do interview a lot of people, so I do have a hand in the hiring process at Google. And I think most, the most typical case in which I've had to uh, reject a client is because they lack a baseline, a, a basic statistical literacy. Um, and I'm just interested, by show of hands, who knows what deep learning means? So yeah, who knows what a t-test is? Okay, so it's about the same, right? Like it's roughly 50-50, and I think that's a problem. <laughs> I think that uh, things, sh knowledge should scale with technical ability, and deep learning is obviously much more difficult than a t-test, right? But, you know, not every, not every single problem requires you know, a, a densely connected network. There are a lot of problems out there that are very simple, and they require much more simple solutions. And so, um, I think part of the issue is that as, uh, and I consider myself to be both a representative of, um, of Google and of the statistics community in general, um, is that there has to be sort of a reconciliation between the statistics as a field and data science more broadly, because I think so far, uh, and this is just my own sort of anecdotal experience with people in the field of statistics, that they sort of go like, oh, this data science stuff, like, it's exciting, but like, you know, we're doing, we're doing the real stuff, we know the actual secret sauce. But we really don't. <laughs> and I think what's important is that we take in more, you know, we learn from you guys just as much as we expect to. So before I talk about talents, I uh, decided to tell a little story about AD and that, on how we've uh, grown in the past few years uh, from zero to, uh, to a very good capability in terms of analytics. So basically we see two different clusters of companies, so global companies. The digitally born companies like Google's, Amazon's, and the known Digitally born companies like us. And mainly the CPGs are on that cluster, right? So, companies like us, we have to go through a major transformation, or major digital transformation, not only in technology, but also on the title of talent perspective. So, really adapt ourselves to, uh, to the new demands of our talents. So, basically, uh, we've, uh, we started here in 2013 in Champaign, Illinois. So, uh, it was our first global uh, capabilities and office focused on data analytics. And normal, uh, normal mistake of a company trying to, uh, to get into the environment of, of data science. So we get a bunch of amazing people with uh, data science uh, background, and we expect that uh, you know, these talents will come up with the solutions or the secret sauce, like you said, uh, for our problems. But that's not exactly how this happens, right? So uh, we understood that we needed to develop a lot our uh, internal capabilities 
on getting more close to the business and make sure that we would be tackling the, the, the pretty much the business problems that is part of the strategy of the company. We evolved and then we developed the different different centers across the globe. So mainly our capabilities and analytics were built here in Champaign and also in India in Bangalore, where we developed the, the growth uh, analytics center and uh, later consolidated under the same umbrella. So basically what we call API uh, analytics. So today we operate hybrid, so we have global uh, center of excellence of analytics, but we also have in our geographical zones analytics teams plus inside each business function. Okay? So basically it's a hybrid COE, uh, center of excellence, and a hybrid uh, uh, business uh, analytics functions. So uh, this is a, a actually a material from Accenture that uh, we use to set our dream. So our dream is to really to be uh, the leading company in, uh, on the CPG uh, uh, sphere in terms of data analytics. So we started from zero. Today we are pretty much uh, leading the way along with a, a PNG. And uh, our, our objective is to really go beyond. Uh, this is the type of capabilities that we have today. So many different things, working on predictive analytics, but also simulations, discrete trust modeling, uh, going to the deep level of uh, zip code uh, type of data in the US, for example, to understand consumer behavior, uh, and also exploring new things such as uh, smart agriculture that we're working with uh, Agribu here in the research park, but also going for, for example, uh, building the brewery of the future, fully automated and, and fully uh, analytics. Uh, in terms of talents, that's pretty much what we see on an end to end process, right? Um, Basically, data is separated from analytics, but when we look at the, the full end-to-end -end process, we have multiple things. So we have the data engineering and infrastructure and the data uh, architecture, that is also a data talent type of profile. And also, we have data analytics at its core, so pretty much data science, and then we have the technology, and this is something for me that is really game changing. Analytics itself, alone, can bring a lot of insights but cannot be consumed at scale and cannot be uh, uh, pretty much uh, generating the, the power of the value without technology behind it, right? So today, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, natural language processing, so all of this IoT is pretty much uh, uh, solutions that we see in the future game changing, that every type of things that we do, we try to embed analytics inside the solution and the applications to make sure that this is sustainable and scalable. And in the end, what we have is the business translator, so the business analytics. And when we look at the, the, pretty much the full, uh, I talk to other companies and we, uh, we benchmark against other companies, we see that this is the biggest gap, the business translator. So when we have pretty much the knowledge or technical knowledge of analytics, plus the business acumen, business understanding, and can talk to the same language as the business. Right? So I think this is for sure, I would say, the sweet spot in terms of um, talents that uh, most of the companies and global companies are looking for right now. Uh, just a few things that we're doing, cool things, uh, to com combine analytics and, and technology. So for example, uh, we had the first autonomous delivery um, made uh, in partnership with Auto and also uh, working with Tesla. Other things, we're using a lot of blockchain and artificial intelligence now to make sure that we can uh, open new markets for, uh, for the media industry. Uh, in the US, a common problem is to sell alcohol uh, uh, to, to, a, to a certain uh, age, so the legal, legal drinking age. We wanted to make sure that technology and analytics can bridge the gap and open, open new, uh, new channels for, for, for our products. And also chatbots and uh, NPL. So basically, we're using the one technology in partnership with WhatsApp. To, uh, to enable multiple purposes to uh, really have no human interaction and all the decisions being made using analytics for selling, for taking orders, for consumer experience, for employee experience, for brands experience, so pretty much that can be replicated to everything. So big learning is uh, technology combined with analytics can be super powerful, can change the way you operate and, uh, and can disrupt yourself. So, it's better you disrupt yourself than someone else. Thank you. And thank you from the panelists. Um, I'll just ask the panelists to consider a, a bit narrower request, a question, and um, Derek might take a little bit of a, a different 
view of this question, but you know, can you talk about how the data explosion has impacted your organization in terms of two things? Really, what your customers or clients expect uh, in terms of a solution or a skill set that you're delivering, and then your demand for people and or talent uh, with a new and ever evolving skill set. And maybe there, from a university perspective, I would think, you know, does that impact uh, the types of students that you look to attract? to statistics and are you training them differently now than maybe you did you know, three or four years ago to ensure that you're producing a student that the market demands? So I, I think we haven't had any trouble attracting the students. Um, in the six years since I've been here, our undergrad program has gone from about 175 students to close to 800. Um, the master's program about 60 or 65 to about 140. And we've recently started to increase the PhD numbers too, now that we have a few more faculty to help. Um, to train them, basically. Uh, so attracting talent hasn't been a problem. We would like to actually attract a more domestic talent. That has been a problem. I think we probably see that across a lot of STEM fields. Um, as far as what we're teaching them, uh, we definitely have made some modifications. Um, several years ago, Laura Ferrix uh, asked us to meet with some folks from Research Park. Uh, a couple of them over at the table over there, Ken and Ross. Uh, they said, we love your students, but they need to be able to program better. So we sat down and we talked about that, and since then we've created a couple more classes that have more programming built in. Uh, we developed several other classes as well, more statistical learning at a less advanced level. We already had a statistical learning class at kind of the master's PhD level, and now there's one more at the junior, senior, early master's level. Um, so we definitely made those sort of adjustments in terms of technology. Um, in terms of preparing them for careers, there have been adjustments there as well. Uh, but I should say on the technology side, a couple of those computing classes, one is a data science foundations class that gets into a little bit of Hadoop and large scale data analysis. Uh, another is a sophomore junior level statistical programming class, which has been really popular over the last couple of years. Um, and on the preparation for career side, uh, we also hear sometimes that STEM students don't have the soft skills that other students do. Uh, so we've been working on preparing them for industry as well. I think our, our statistics students, I think, don't quite fit into the same uh, mold of having real difficulty with soft skills that some other disciplines sort of get uh, saddled with. Um, in statistics, we've always been in the business of solving other people's problems. It's what we do, right? Somebody brings their data to us, they want answers from it, we extract that information. So there's always been kind of that communication. Um, so, you know, we're trying to get more project work into classes for certain. We've got a professional statistics class that I mentioned earlier, where we do consulting or not consulting projects. The students are working in groups, they're giving presentations, they're writing reports. Uh, the other classes that I teach, I always make sure they're group projects in there as well. So I think making sure that we're preparing them to work with others, to communicate with others, is that key. Okay. So I guess um, I think two things are key just in the time that I have been in the field of data science. The last several years, I think, as we've seen the, the evolution of the skills that are required, we've moved from what used to be lots and lots of prepackaged programs and, and, and um, sort of best of breed kinds of staffs to moving to a world where we're really um, looking at solving a lot of these bigger challenges with open source packages like R and Python, which um, necessitates a level of software understanding and programming skills that we just simply didn't need before. So as, as Darren has pointed out, and I've had um, some of my Darren students in, um, in my labs as, as Kepler um, team members, that, that transition is really, I think, what has ne necessitated um, the changes at the academic level to equip students to have those programming skills and, and basic languages that um, perhaps weren't as necessary before when we were, the world was a little bit more of a, a straight SQL kind of world. Um, as, the, as the kinds of data uh, have gotten more diverse and the volume of data has gotten larger, um, the challenges that come with addressing that data in terms of the skills, the thinking skills, and the analytical skills that are necessary have also become more complex. 
Um, so that's certainly something that we're looking for, not just the technical skills, but your, your problem-solving skills and how you think about approaching a problem and breaking it down into pieces and really being thoughtful about what it is you're trying to solve and to what ability math can help you solve that and to what, and to what extent it cannot. Um, I think that's probably the, the main changes that we've seen. And so when we're looking for folks to join our analytics teams, we're looking for a combination of that technical acumen as well as your, um, just your analytical ability to be able to understand the nature of the problem and work in, work in teams, um, particularly in teams that are multidisciplinary because rarely ever in our world are we working with on a, on a team where we only interact with other people who are of the same skill set and background. Um, and so to your question, Brooke, about what academia could help us do differently, um, teamwork is absolutely a part of it, but multidisciplinary teamwork is also extremely important. And we're seeing more of that um, here at Illinois in terms of being able to um, add uh, analytics types uh, concentrations or electives to uh, a degree that is perhaps not, doesn't appear on the surface to be related. So, I think, I think there's evidence, um, particularly here at Illinois, that academia is responding. I think we have to do more of that if we really, truly want to equip our new um, team members coming out of school and joining um, you know, whatever company or industry that, that they um, begin their careers in um, to be as effective as they can be as quickly as they can be. So for us, when we look at the individuals that work well on the team, we are looking for a very hybrid person. We're looking for that person that is probably not the, and this is just for us, we're not looking for the person who's gonna be that PhD statistician um, and, and not balanced in business acumen and doesn't understand SQL and doesn't understand how to integrate with the team. We're looking for someone who is strong in stats. We are looking for someone who is strong in Python and R um, or you know, what we had historically used was a enterprise system out of the box. I'm not going to say the vendor's name, but it starts with an S and ends with an S. <laughs> and the middle letter's an A, so I don't say it. <laughs> but we're looking more for open source. We're looking for those coders that understand how to work with data. I had a conversation with another person earlier about, about what they teach in, in academia, and I think they, they give you somewhat of a false perspective of what's out there. You know, I get a data set, or I get a couple data sets, and they're noisy. They're full of all kinds of gaps. It is very unstructured in some cases. It's messy data. It's not a nice little data frame that you just push to an algorithm. I mean, the predictive layer is probably the most straightforward part of it. Looking at the summary statistics, is it a good model, is it not? But all that work that goes into feature engineering, the cleaning up the data, and even getting it through cybersecurity, even getting approval to look at the data and governance, and all of that, backlog work, that takes time, and that takes communication skills, and that takes sales skills, honestly, because you, you kind of have to sell that you need the data. So it, it can be a challenge, and when we get the data lake, I think it'll probably be a little bit less painful, but the explosion of data in our environment has led us to, we have sensors, so we're in, I work at Amarna, an energy company, so we have sensors in these energy generating, these very, very large scale boilers, and we have sensors that say all over the place, thousands of them that say is this something off, is something on. That's good, but now we have an overflow of notifications, false positives all over the place, right? And I think the same can be said with data scientists. There's a bunch of false positives, right? Yeah? <laughs> and, and I'm not saying that everyone is, but there are people that can say that they're a data scientist and they can code and they can persist data through a data model and they know when a model is good, they know when a t-test is, <laughs> or deep learning or neural nets. But they don't, you know. And so it, it's hard to see through that. And, and so that's where we are. Is we have an explosion of data. We don't really, to be honest, we don't know what we don't know yet about it. We're kind of going backward and building in foundational pieces to prepare us to be able to more fully utilize the data. And we are a team of growing, so we will be adding people very soon. At this moment, we're not, but we will be. So. Yeah, so I think uh, an anecdote from an engineer that I'm working with on that product probably sums up like Google's position on the size of our data and that being an issue in that he said all really Google is good at is serving a giant table at scale. Meaning that we've learned like just through years and years and years of having an unreasonable amount of data. Like uh, that we've learned how to 
at scale serve just a table of numbers. <laughs> and, and then that, the ramifications of that is that you end up with YouTube or you end up with Google Maps. Um, I think you see at Google, um, our main problems are that all of our data is, is pretty much unstructured. And so there's no such concept as like loading in a CSV file. That just doesn't exist. I mean, uh, I pray for the day that, uh, like the days that I get to you, like, we call it Dremel, which is our version of our high-speed sort of data aggregation systems, um, where I can just send a SQL server to it. More often than not, than not, it's like writing a map produce. And so I would agree um, with, I think, the general sentiment here is that there's a, large, a very long tail of things that you have to do as a data scientist from day to day that is not statistically balanced, that is more on the side of like actually building pipelines and like coding multiple languages and making sure that your data is consistent. Once you get past that, I think our uh, data is at a scale um, that we have to be extremely clever not to do things wrong um, or to do things that, with any sort of speed or any sort of um, assurances that like the algorithms that we have are actually converting in the way that we intend to. Uh, because when you work at data at our scale, you don't get things like if you want to run like a, um, for example, like a Bayesian to you know, factor mix model, you can't look at like the um, convergence plot in Stan because it would crash Stan because we just had like there are too many numbers grinding through the system. Um, so you have to be very clever to make sure that your core assumptions are valid from the get-go. Um, more broadly speaking, I think that uh, our sort of core competency is tooling. Um, a lot of the work that we have, and you see this with tools like MapReduce, TensorFlow, BigQuery, a lot of the things that are now uh, included on Google Cloud Suite, which is my, I think, obligatory page for that. Um, a lot of those uh, technologies that we're now servicing to businesses um, externally has, have existed at Google for years. Um, and that's sort of how generally we release products, is that we release them to engineering staff first, and we sort of like build up and understand and A-B test until we get a nice product like BigQuery. Um, if you've seen BigQuery before, you've worked with BigQuery, uh, Big um, it is what we've been calling Dremel at Google for years. Um, and so through that sort of like process of experimentation, we're able to build up the technology and the tooling such that a lot of the actual difficult stuff is sort of abstract. So when I say I write a MapReduce, I actually write a really nice wrapper around a MapReduce. I'm not actually handwriting a MapReduce. I've actually looked back at our code repository of like, Map reduces that people had to write by hand, and it looks good. I'm really glad that I never had to do that. Um, in terms of talent that we look for, I can only speak to uh, my experience as, as a statistics student. Um, I think that the courses that benefited me the most as a uh, data scientist today are the ones that were computationally aimed. So things like Stat 428, at least that's what it was called, uh, which was statistical computing, was an awesome course. Uh, because it's talking it's just about randomization and randomization in the context of the algorithms. Um, or thing, concepts like sampling, which become extremely important when the scale of the data is so big that you couldn't ever fit an algorithm to your entire data set. It just is impossible. Um, I do think that, uh, and I was very lucky as an undergrad to take a ton of uh, CS courses. I believe I was only like one course short of a uh, minor. Um, so should have tried to actually get it, but I did. Um, I was very lucky to be able to take a ton of CS courses, so I took things like numerical methods and um, whatever like the, the core, um, I think like C++ course that they teach here. Um, and so I came into the role in a, like my previous position at Nielsen with pretty strong programming skills. And I think that that is something that's absolutely essential. Uh, we see a lot of candidates that come in and they are basically told that they are going to be you know, useless for the first six months. And it's because our engineering systems are extremely complex, and you have to be able to build a core competency with your engineering systems. And uh, having students that come in with a mixture of computer science and um, physical skills would be amazing. And they just kind of like don't exist as people. Um, to the point of communication, I think that I'll have to disagree slightly with uh, Darren is that I do believe that the pejorative sort of STEM beliefs that uh, people in STEM can't communicate completely extends to statisticians. Um, and so I think 
One thing that we specifically select for are strong communication skills. Uh, I've had extremely brilliant people that I've interviewed uh, that are PhDs in statistics or quantitative political science or quantitative sociology at places like Stanford and Berkeley that I've had to say no to because they cannot communicate. They cannot <laughs> fluently speak about the things that they care about. And so one thing that I would suggest to any student here, and especially any grad student, is that if you get an opportunity to teach at some point in your, in your grad student career, I think teaching is the number one most effective way to build good communication skills. So I TA for two semesters in my final uh, year of grad school, and I pretty much solely attribute that as my ability to pass the Google interview process, which is uh, broadly known as being extremely brutal uh, because it requires four technical, four or 45 minute back to back technical interviews where you have to speak fluently about these difficult concepts and with a smile on your face and seem like you're very really positive. And that's something that you kind of learn as a teacher especially as a tired grad student. You learn that as a TA. And so I think one avenue that we could, like, I think broadly speaking, you know, part of the, you know, uh, one of the topics of this panel is to uh, talk about improving communication skills. Uh, and I think that pragmatically, if anybody in this audience is here, if they have a, the opportunity to teach, I highly suggest that you seize the opportunity. So what, what we've been uh, seeing in terms of demand and, uh, and also uh, uh, how to attract talent so on, on, the, on the data and the like field really, is first is to really have a purpose, to really have something, a challenge that, uh, that would resonate as well with, uh, with, the, with the talent that is uh, interested in joining the company. Uh, if you don't do that, uh, probably, most likely, you're not going to have the best talents. So it needs to be something with a purpose, and I can give some examples. Uh, for example, the team that is developing the intelligent uh, agriculture and smart farming. So what they're doing today, they're, they're helping farmers to, uh, to develop their skills in terms of being better farmers, right? This will help the industry to grow uh, um, uh, better grains, better quality of products, but at the same time, they're impacting on the community and the life of people. So this is a big purpose on someone working, for example, on this type of experience, right? So, uh, this is super relevant, I think, uh, if that connects to the strategy of the company and the person is part of the strategy and it's embedded on the, on the definition of the roadmap of the company in terms of goals, targets, and etc., I think uh, 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 the person experience uh, pretty much the full end-to-end uh, uh, -end understanding of the business, not only on the piece that on the day-to-day -day would be working, for example, on the data science piece, but understand the full uh, spectrum of what is the purpose, what is the goal, plus what is the origin of the, the, the experiments, up to what is the insights and the ROI that is generating out of that, right? So what we try to do is to put people in this situation, out of the comfort, to really go beyond the, the boundaries of uh, their own scope, and try to understand a little bit more uh, where this, this, this uh, specific position or role is positioned. The second thing I think that is relevant is I think the companies are changing how in ways of working and how they operate. Right? If you think about the squad model or pretty much the, the, the concept of squad or getting diverse backgrounds together, trying to, uh, to rapid prototyping and um, I think this can be um, super valuable in terms of uh, aggregating different types of skill sets trying to, to, to solve a single problem. Right? So uh, a data science person or a data analytics person or a data engineer, not necessarily they need to work in their style, right? The best and statistically proven is diverse groups can have better results, right? So if you put um, smart people together with different skill sets, probably the outcome of your project or experiment will be much better than working in silos. So we've been changing the way we operate, organizing by squads and uh, in uh, rapid prototyping, if you fail, fail fast, right, and move on. So I think this type of concept, I think, makes the company, their organization more agile to move faster, especially if you uh, are a company like us that is going through, through a, a, a digital transformation process. Uh, and the third thing about academia, I think what is relevant is really the, the, the it's, it's academia to, to put people together with different skill sets. Again, back to the diversity, right? So stats, the people together with CS, with info science, 
trying to work together in projects and rapid prototyping for them to understand and get uh, different types of skill sets and technical uh, uh, experiences. And, uh, and the second thing, I think collaboration with the, with the industry, I think is super relevant. Because it brings you a different perspective of academia. And I think the exchange of knowledge between academia and the industry, I think uh, is super valuable for these students. Uh, so I think they will be better prepared for the market and to be at Google, to be at ABI, in Emory. So I think uh, all of us, I think, pretty much are doing the same thing, right? So we are here at the research park, for example, to collaborate and to attract the best talents, but at the same time to give back to the students a unique experience that they can really understand the industry side and how we see things different a little bit from academia. Thank you. Um, the last question I'll ask the panel to address is, what are your organizations doing to address the demand for an increase in analytics talent? And really, how are you adapting your people strategies, not only in terms of recruitment, which we've all spoken about a little bit today, but also in terms of development? And I'll say from the College of Business perspective, you know, we are recruiting a different type of talent in our faculty than we ever have before. Um, in the part of County, we have a full professor with a PhD in astrophysics. Five years ago, that would have been thought as, as really crazy. Now, only a few people think it's really crazy. Um, and so, you know, we continue, we continue to just hire different types of people. Um, as head of accountancy, I'm not interested in hiring even a tenure track faculty member who doesn't have some interest in embedding analytics or technology in one of our courses. And, and it's we've never thought about hiring in the College of Business in that way. Um, we're also making big investments in terms of upskilling the skill set of our current faculty who maybe, you know, got a PhD at a time in a business-related discipline where analytics and technology was not a focus. So I'm just curious to hear how your organizations are investing in talent that you have and make, ensuring that the talent that you do attract uh, keeps on the leading edge. And maybe we'll start with Raphael. Okay. Uh, I think two things. On the attraction side, uh, what we've been doing is, is, is pretty much building programs on the attraction piece and partnership with uh, universities in the US, in India, and in Brazil, and other countries in a very similar way, standard. Uh, but it's not an attraction problem, it's an experience problem. Right? So basically we attract people to be part of a, a program, a 10 to 12 weeks uh, program, that pretty much is put in on a spot with, uh, with, uh, with different type of skill sets. So basically we have engineers, we have developers, we have data analytics folks, cybersecurity folks. And normally we bring a startup from the ecosystem, from Silicon Valley, from, uh, from all different places, to work together to develop something tangible. Right? So we wanted to make sure that these people, uh, when they have this experience, they understand the culture of the company, but at the same time, they are able to deliver something that it would be uh, pretty much proud of it, right? So this past uh, program that we finished a few uh, weeks ago, so we had, uh, for example, a vending machine that we developed in 10 weeks uh, that do sobriety tests uh, pretty much with a finger, fingerprint in seconds and more accurate the breathalyzer, right? So just a smart, young, talented people together, putting their brains to develop something that is simply amazing and now it's a patent pending uh, uh, product. So um, uh, this is a type of things that we're doing on, on the attraction side. Putting an experience and not only uh, 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 you know, bringing turns to, uh, to, uh, to work in several different projects and uh, outside the business. So we're putting the, the students in the center. Uh, the development of this, I think it's important. And I think the motivation for, for the talents on, uh, on the analytics field I think it's to understand uh, uh, how we progress in terms of learning, right? So uh, recently what we're, we're working in, in is uh, developing a career path uh, in technology and analytics. Uh, that they can understand that they can go beyond their own uh, um, area of, uh, of uh, expertise. Because ultimately what we want to do is to embed the analytics across the functions. Not only be centralized anymore, but make sure that in every function like sales, marketing, we have the analytics uh, embedded on the, on the operations. So in order to, uh, to, uh, to make it happen, we need to make sure that we expose people to those uh, uh, different business functions. Right? And, and naturally, the cross-functional uh, moves is, is, is already embedded in our culture. So I'm a, a finance guy that uh, was the head of analytics and now I'm the head of HR. So this is naturally, this is something that happens in our company. We're just using this as, a, as an avenue or a, a vehicle to make sure that with the talent from the tax perspective and the analytics perspective are in the same uh, uh, approach and then we have pretty much uh, um, 
our tech and analytics folks uh, embedded in all business functions. Now, more and more, we see that uh, we see that uh, analytics skill sets. It's going to be some. It is already something that uh, is a pre-requirement today, right? You cannot take decisions anymore based on gut feeling or business knowledge, right? Today, it's uh, every company, small, big, and global companies, they have to take decisions on a data-driven basis, right? And if you have uh, this type of skill sets, you can have better judgment on taking decisions, right? So uh, uh, that's the culture that we that we are developing to so make sure that the full business uh, is is embedded with uh, with analytics uh, moving forward. So I think on the attraction piece, like uh, I don't, I think Google for a very long time we kind of rested on the fact that like there's a perception, at least internally, that everyone wants to work at Google, um, or like a lot of people do, and uh, that doesn't that's not really tenable nowadays because there's tons of competitors, and it's not on on comment that we have somebody that we extend an offer to you um, that would have accepted it two years ago, but instead went to someone like LinkedIn or Facebook because they were able to. Uh, get more embedded on a more interesting project, or that they're more interested in that company's long-term growth. Um, so I think uh, there is a general perception uh, at Google um, in the data science community that maybe about 10 years ago the statisticians came in and we uh, rigged the questions for the interview process such that uh, we only accept statisticians and then we slammed the door on everybody else. And I think that we're working extremely hard to make sure that's not true um, anymore because uh, I work with a ton of dudes that are from Stanford, from the stat department, and that's a problem, right? We want, like you had mentioned earlier, we, it, a team only works as well as, it's, as it is diverse, right? Diverse opinions and diverse backgrounds work better together than undiverse opinions and undiverse backgrounds. And so we're working extremely hard to make sure that we get people from a lot of different areas and a lot of different backgrounds, such as why I'm here, right? This is not a typical, I think, university that like a big tech company used to like try to recruit from, and now we're trying to recruit from it because we see that the depth of talent, the depth of people that come from this university, and how they interact with other people that come from other sort of backgrounds and other sort of universities, um, it, we just tend to build better teams with more diverse opinions and more diverse backgrounds. Um, for the component of the question, which was like, how do we like sort of foster, you know, analytics uh, more generally? I think it's I don't have a clear answer. I'm, I'm maybe not like the uh, best person to answer this because I am like a you know STEM to a T. Unfortunately, like I, I do come from a statistics background uh, and I basically only took stack computer science classes. So, um, but I do think it is easier uh, now than ever to get a data science background. I mean, you can go to Code Academy or uh, Data Robot or you can take uh, do practice questions on things like Hacker Noon and websites like that, there are tons of resources to learn data science from a non-traditional background, and those people are awesome. They always come in and they always blow us away. There are um, companies like uh, Metis and Galvanize that uh, have like longer form uh, sort of like data science training programs, and generally those people come in better prepared than someone that uh, is just coming in with the university degree. Um, and I think it's because they learn very intensively sort of core competencies that are necessary for a data science background. Um, I, I do think that diversity, um, I, I know I've kind of, I've been the person up here uh, preaching uh, the <laughs> magic of statistics and like uh, being an advocate for statistics here, but I do think that uh, the best people that we hire, the people that do the best are people that don't come from strictly statistics backgrounds, but uh, come from some sort of quantitative branch of another background. Uh, for example, my technical lead had a uh, PhD in sociology. He was a formal professor at, in Paris um, of sociology, and he just learned data science skills on his own, and then he applied it to his research, and then he decided that he wanted to go down that path, and he's awesome. And I think the reason that those people are always awesome data scientists is because it doesn't just take a knowledge of statistics or computer science or cloud computing uh, to be able to do your job well, but you have to understand subject matter. You have to be able to take a complex problem and build a sort of semantic network in your mind 
that maps to your sort of quantitative skills. And I think that that is something that we try really hard to make sure that candidates can do in the interview process. And the vast majority of the time, when I've interviewed someone um, for a position at Google, they tend to have, the, the area that they tend to struggle in, if they struggle at all, is trying to take a sort of broad problem, we tell them ambiguity, and sort of build a solution that those want to do. We don't have a luxury of being Google, so <laughs> it doesn't mean a whole lot when we say, we're Amber, all right, technology. Oh yeah, um, man, you guys, <laughs> I, was, I was your customer for many years. <laughs> But we are, we're not a stodgy old utility company. We are a company that's moving forward. We're, we're making strides in analytics. And how are we doing that? We are bringing data to many of the conversations. And we're also spending a lot of time networking with universities. We, we have a spot over here in Research Park that Owen Doyle leads and he interacts with students very often. We also have a relationship with St. Louis University. We have four students coming in to join our team coming January for a couple of months on some projects. And so we are we're very interested in doing what we can to bring students in and teach them the real world of what data does for Amron. We're also looking to network, and we do a lot of things in networking outside of Amron. One of the stories I like to share that, that recently, now I guess it's been a little while that worked for me, was I like LinkedIn. I'm a big LinkedIn fan, that's my playground. And I read a book some years ago by a gentleman by the name of Vincent Granville. You guys have ever heard of Vincent Granville? He, he wrote this book, it's called um, Developing Analytic Talent, and it was a great book, so I'd encourage you to read it if you get a chance. He's also the creator of a website called Data, Data Central, or uh, datasciencecentral.com, and it's a really good, it's another playground for me. I love going out there. There's some really innovative thinkers on that site, and I didn't know that until I went out to LinkedIn, <laughs> and I looked up Vincent Granville, and I said, okay, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try to connect to Vincent Granville through LinkedIn. I could have followed him, but I invited him to join my social network, and he did. He accepted. And then I was able to look at his groups, and then I was able to go to the places where he plays. And I learned a ton just by doing that and started to interact with LinkedIn on his posts that he was putting out there, people in his social network. And so it allowed me to use networking somewhat indirectly to get the, the mental nourishment, the data science nourishment that, that I needed. And I continue to do that, and so I would encourage you to, to consider doing something like that. But the point being that the way that we get better as a utility company is not by thinking we have all the answers, right? It's about going out, talking to people, and finding out what things that they're doing, and trying to apply those complex solutions that they're applying to our complex problems. And so those are the things we're doing. So, being from a heavy equipment manufacturer, I'm sure the first thing you think of when you think of Caterpillar is analytics, right? It's the first thing, yeah. So, well, being here um, and on multiple campuses, right, the way that we're trying to uh, attract talent, I think the first step is really that you have to engage them and you have to inform them. They have to think about Caterpillar as a company who has data and interesting technical problems to be solved um, with a variety of business um, tools, data tools, and technology tools. So, so that, that first step is really just engaging and informing people that whether or not that's how um, your company might be perceived off the cuff, those uh, interesting business challenges are still there and they're ever present in any company, in any industry. So just getting them informed that there are cool analytical problems to solve at Caterpillar is the first step. All right, and the second step is really understanding them as an individual and thinking about and mirroring up what their interests are with what your challenges are and giving them, connecting them to a team and a, and a business challenge that your company has that plays off their interests. And then finally, right, what are they passionate about? If you can match up what they're passionate about, that, um, that, that educational, that interest, the, the, the personal interest, whatever it is, uh, like the, the gentleman that you described that sort of turned his career um, towards data science out of need and is in his um, research career and then decided that, that he wanted to take a different turn in his professional career. If you can match up, if you can find those passions and people and play to them and, and design corporate um, a human systems that will allow that that and enable and, and, and propel people through those paths in your company, you can start out as a data scientist and end up as the chief people officer. 
Right. It's so, so I think the key and the challenge for all of us in corporate to attract talent is to change our internal human systems so that we can attract, we can attract and educate and engage um, with people's interests and talents and then propel them through our companies and keep them with us because they're hard to find, they're expensive to attract, and they're even more difficult to replace once we've had them for a while and they've built some subject matter knowledge um, in our companies. Uh, and as far as the Department of Statistics, we've been hiring and hiring, hiring as much as we can. Uh, some of the ways we've changed our hiring, we've got a big non-tenure track search in progress right now to bring in more teaching and clinical faculty um, who may have backgrounds outside of statistics. Um, they have more computational background. They have more background in biostatistics or, or biology in general. Those are a couple of areas we've been targeting data science and biostats in general recently. Um, so that we can try to keep up with this flood of students that's been coming in. Uh, we're also recruiting tenure track faculty as well. So we have one of those searches in progress as well. So we're trying to staff up as quickly as we can on the faculty side. Um, in terms of some of the other ways we're staffing up, more advisors. Um, we're hopefully going to hire another career-related person soon um, to take some of that off my shoulders and I will work on some other things. Um, and we're in the process of trying to hire a couple of IT-related folks. One who would be an educational technology specialist working on helping faculty members build the systems they need to teach the classes they need to teaching and one who works more with Atlas to work directly with the IT folks in college. Um, so those are some ways that we're, we're changing our hiring, um, trying to staff up. Uh, other things are making sure that we talk with industry. And I think that's something that we've done a bit of in the last several years. We can always talk more, happy to talk after this. Um, let's discuss where your needs are and what we can do to address those. And how we can work together. I think that's a big part of it as well. I think all of us on the academic side want to be engaged with industry, understand what it is you need and how we can help there. And also obtain your help. Um, Beth has a couple of projects in one of my classes this semester. That's fantastic. The students get real world uh, experience uh, working with a client. Um, and that's, that's hugely valuable for that communication piece and for preparing for uh, the career. Uh, I think I misspoke a little bit earlier because I'm not saying statistics students are great communicators all the time. <laughs> I, I just feel that sometimes we're in a little better shape than, uh, than some of the other STEM majors. We need a lot of help there too. And any help we can get from the industry is fantastic. Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have. Oh, Jim, Just make that final point. Yeah. So that, that's something that I, I think it's important. Also, I think that. Uh, I think it's important the culture of analytics embedded in the entire company. I think this is something that, uh, that we're investing right now. So our Carlos Brito, our CEO, is taking out a training, a full training on technology and analytics, and also doing uh, reverse mentoring with uh, new talents, uh, young talents, and uh, I think uh, putting a, one of the top uh, CPGs in the world and the CEO dedicating time for this. I think it's super relevant, and I think uh, all companies uh, should be doing this especially the ones that are going through a major uh, digital transformation, to make sure that your C-level and, the, and the pretty much the leadership is, 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 is pretty much committed to making things happen through analytics and through uh, technology. That's the new world, right? If they are not in this uh, uh, type of sphere and, and knowledge, probably their decisions will not be uh, most of the digital ones, right? So for them to speak the same language, you need to empower them with, uh, with knowledge. In your talents, then especially the ones, the young ones that has, uh, uh, that have pretty much the, the, the new concepts, the new ways of operating, the new uh, motivations, are the ones that can really change uh, pretty much their perception on, on how things are going to be in the future, right? So um, I would like to invite all of you talents that are coming to the to the industry to really bring this uh, this type of behavior to the companies and and for the companies that are here really to, to, to invest on your senior leadership and make sure you cascade down with the entire organization, the culturalization of uh, technology and analytics. Thank you. Trevor, we could just do with me thanking our panelists.